Um, someone blessed the church by going through and taking some of our hymnals that were falling apart and they put the binding on the back of this tape. I don't know who did that, uh, but I want to thank you for doing that. This was quite a while ago. But now we have a few more that are in need. So whoever has the tape or knows where we can get it, Marshall's pointing it out to me. So thank you. Yeah, if they need to be fixed, give them to me, I can fix them. I'll take this one. You. If, you, right if you look at your hymnals and it looks like anything like this, uh, just drop it off at, uh, at the back desk there, please, on your way out. Okay? Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Let's, let's put those hymnals someplace so that we know we can get them. No, just drop them off in the back on your desk there. On the way out, if you just take it with you and just drop it off back there. Thank you. Um, it's good to see you all. And uh, don't, I don't think I say it enough, but I really love you guys. And I'm excited night to, night to be with you. Yeah, the pastoral staff here, the, the officers of the church, we're here for you. And... Uh, it would just, it, nothing would give us greater pleasure than to know we're being of service to you in any way that you need it. So please don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call us. Um, if we get, you just need to talk, you need to pray through something, if you just, if you need some help with your, with something that's going on at home or anything like that, I, I, I don't think we've, we've said it enough, but please know that you can do that. Um, because we are a, a church that wants to be loving and, and, and definitely more than just in words. So please take us up on that. All right, uh, this morning I'd like to uh, pick up where uh, Pastor Briggs was downstairs. He uh, was talking about um, our, our desire should be uh, towards holiness, for holiness, uh, so that we can be used by the Holy Spirit and we want to be used by the Holy Spirit not to live better lives, not to be more affluent uh, or be great political figures. Uh, we want to be used of the Holy Spirit for what purpose? To bring forth the gospel to a lost people. Thank you, Greg. To glorify God. To glorify God. Thank you, Lauren. So to glorify God and to fulfill the Great Commission, to do what Jesus did. To, um, um, to do what the Father wants us to do and to say what the Father wants us to say. This is why we, this is why we are here. This is why we are passionate about our, our relationship with the Lord and what we have to share with others. This gives, should give us great joy, great joy. So I want to continue in that. I'd like to read from this morning from 2 Peter chapter 1. Verses 2 through 8. So if you turn there, let's read it together. Please stand for the reading of God's word. And then, Claire, I'd like to ask you for your help this morning with the music. <clears throat> Second Peter, chapter 1. Verses 2 through 8. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. According as, as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, hath called us to glory and virtue. I'm sorry, I skipped a line there. Uh, okay, let me read that again. Verse 3. According as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, to the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or love. 
For if these things be new and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe my wife did me the honor of teaching this passage to our children to memorize. And I, I know it's going to stick with them for the rest of their lives. It'd be a good passage for us to memorize. All right, let's take our hymnals now and turn to number 382. Be thou my vision. Thank you. 
second language. Raise your hand, Ray. <laughs> How many of you are English is your second language? Okay, I see Donnie, I see Misuk, she's English second language. I just want you to know how much I respect you for doing this. I have tried, because for Misuk, I have put the Korean on the slides, and I've tried to teach myself to read Korean. <laughs> right. I have. I have given it up, Misuk. It's not going well. So I, I have, um, when I see you, you, uh, you know, particularly you folks in this service, I think it's amazing that you're here with us worshiping. I am um, honored, truly honored, that you, that you would worship with us. Also, I am honored to worship with this whole group as we come together. I, I, I think it's very special. Uh, I think it's amazing. And uh, and third, since uh, Emma's not here, right? Um, Emma would have enjoyed the Sunday school lesson about uh, our role, our job as being uh, uh, preachers of the word. You know, from, from Walmart, I have gotten three calls for folks who want to talk about uh, the church and the Lord. And it's because Emma is passing out my business card. To people as they go through this, the store, to both both uh, patrons and also to employees, she's quite the evangelist there. Uh, I'm impressed and uh, I'm very very uh, honored uh, to have her do that kind of a thing. So, um, 
See the angel behind me? Well, the angel is like, you remember in Daniel where the angel got there a couple weeks late? Because he uh, had to fight his way down. This angel had to fight his way, is it his or hers? Yeah, it's, an angel. it's a yeah. It's, it's an, an angel. angel. Yeah, <laughs> it was supposed to be here last Sunday, but the battle with Satan delayed him from getting here. She's, so he's behind me. The Book of Revelation is the most amazing study on angels that you're going to find in the entire Bible, and uh, and we'll focus on them as we go through. Angels play a part in in twenty of the twenty two chapters, and are mentioned I think individually over seventy times. In that book. So if you want to study angels, that's where you start. Well, uh, I, I, I am super excited about this uh, this part of our book of uh, Revelation study. Last week we um, opened our, our, our study. Go to the next slide, please, Lauren. Um, we're going to just do a quick review. Uh, we anticipated being blessed as we studied this book and let me see if I can find my niece. There's my niece. Remember those seven beatitudes. Right there they are. The seven beatitudes that will that you will be blessed by studying this book. Um, both the reader, the hearer, are said to be blessed by, by keeping it. So tell me, what does it mean to keep it? What does that mean? I'm looking for a specific... Obey, to Obey it? I like that. To practice. To practice it. I like that too. Because we'll never perfect it. Yes. Yes, sir. Molding. Molding. Okay. That's the word that I think we used last week. Thank you, John. So you guys are all three correct. What, what we want to do with this book as we study it is mold our lives around it. We mold our lives around it. Uh, and, and, and what's contained in the book. The word bless appears how many times in the book of Revelation? Seven. Seven. It appears seven times, and, uh, and, and it's often referred to as the seven Beatitudes of the book of Revelation. So to study this, the Beatitude, by the way, what does Beatitude mean? What does the word mean? Conduct. Blessed. It means blessed. It means you're, 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 you're right in there, Greg, though. Don't keep going. Blessed. It means to be supremely blessed. So the first Beatitude, we're blessed if we hear, read, and apply the words of this prophecy. John used the words, the word mold, and that's what I, how I see it. You mold your life. You live your life around the words of this prophecy. I'm telling you guys, is the most amazing thing that the human mind cannot comprehend. We cannot comprehend what's ahead of us. We just, we could never get our brains around it. So even as we study God's word, uh, in our early men's meeting, we were studying, uh, Kevin was uh, teaching a lesson on um, the Sabbath. And I have just been eating it up. And trying to get my brain around the, 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 the Sabbath idea. The, it's a, the book of Revelation is like that. There's data here that is just amazing. It will bless you if you read here and then apply those words to the prophecy. A big part of the molding is to have a forward look, a look into the future. Because what does, we talked about this earlier. Kevin, what does the word hope mean? Confident expectation. Confident expectation. That means you're looking forward to something. Expectation isn't the current here and now. It's what we have ahead of us, okay? The second beatitude is we're blessed. Um, uh, they which die in the Lord. When we pass on from this life and this shell dies, we will go on to be with the Lord. So we have a future with Jesus, looking forward again. Number three, blessed is he that is preparing for the coming of Jesus. You prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ, you will not fail to live a holy life. You won't fail it. If you think he's coming and you, have, and you live your life as though you believe he is coming, you will lead a holy life. You will. That's just the way it is. Chuck Swindoll quoted a former boss of his. Uh, I have an awesome book that, uh, that I think four different uh, people in his status, you know, the big shots, got together and they each wrote a part of this book. It's an amazing book. 
but he quoted a former boss of his when, when Chuck was going into the ministry, and his boss said, if we stay ready, we won't ever need to get ready. Right? right. If we stay ready, you won't ever need to get ready. Because you'll always be ready. Now, the, the statement that I just made that I quoted Chuck on, you would think that was the greatest thing a guy could preach from the pulpit, right? That had nothing to do with the faith-based thing at all. Chuck was saying that he worked in a, uh, a mill where they would ma manufacture tools and his boss was always ready for lunch. Always ready for lunch. And, uh, and Chuck asked him about it and he says, well, if we stay ready for lunch, we're always going to be ready for lunch. So Chuck took that statement and melded it a little bit into what I consider to be a great statement about our faith. If we stay ready, we won't ever need to get ready because we will always be ready. So here we are. Blessed is the one that is preparing for the coming of the Lord Jesus because that will cause you to lead a holy life. My goodness, it has changed my whole outlook. I'm looking forward to his coming, and I want to live my life in a holy way so that when he comes back, I, am, I was ready for it. Then the fourth beatitude, blessed, we are blessed because we're called on to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What do you think they serve at the marriage supper of the Lamb? I'm just curious. Bacon. Anything you want? Bacon. Lots of bacon. All the bacon you can eat. I think the Jews will join us. They'll be, they'll be relieved. <laughs> finally. They will finally be able to eat it in the open. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. How about the fifth one? Blessed, we're blessed because we're considered holy and we're a partaker of the first resurrection. What is the difference between the first and the second resurrections? The first one is for believers. First one is for believers. What's the second one for? Judgment. Judgment. Yeah, so we are blessed because we take a part in the first resurrection. And then number six, we're blessed if we live our lives like we truly believe the sayings of the prophecy of this book are real. So Jose said it uh, earlier, we, that we really believe that what we believe is really real. And because of that, we mold our lives around it. We live our lives that way. And then number seven, we're blessed if we do his commandments. Uh, we learned that God has, uh, has directed that Jesus Christ, he's going to unveil the heavenly mysteries to his bondservants. Who are his bondservants? Us. Us. We're the believers. And that these things must shortly take place or shortly come to pass. And finally, we, le we learned... Uh, last week, that the time of the fulfillment of these things is near. And I believe very near. I believe very near. I believe that I may not finish this message today. It is that near. So we need to live our lives as though we believe that's to be true. Every step we take should be one towards our future in heaven. Every step we take. I mean to tell you, I'm pretty stoked about what's ahead. Every lake has trophy fish. Everyone. Um, there's a lake over in Nebraska. Granny and I, I took her there uh, last year. It's just a little gravel pit. She caught the biggest bass of her life, the biggest rock bass of her life. Yeah. <laughs> the biggest... Four species you crappie. caught. What's that? Biggest crappie. Biggest crappie. I have to say that she caught a 17-inch crappie that I have not uh, ever seen its equal. And what was the fourth one? Rock bass, smallmouth bass, smallmouth and largemouth bass. Four her her personal best out of this little gravel pit. In heaven, every lake is like that. Everyone. I'm just so stoked about being there. I think it's going to be amazing. Any thoughts on the first three verses of Revelation before we go to Revelation 1-4? Okay, next slide please, Lauren. This should be the... Okay. Oh, 
Is this the... There we go. There we go. Okay. Thank you, sir. Revelation 1.4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Do you think John was fired up? Yeah. Do you think he was? Sure. My goodness! It's like he is sitting at a Viking game. He is fired up, and he's expecting to win. Amen? It's the wrong game. Oh, wrong game. Wrong, wrong team. <laughs> wrong team. <laughs> I think he's so fired up here. I was going to include verses 7 and 8 in our study today, but... Uh, there's, there's just so much to pick through here that uh, I guess we'll skip those and, and hit those verses next week. Next slide, please, Lauren. So let's start our, our study today with Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4. Now, I forgot my pointer. Granny, can you dig it out of that black bag? It's in the, um, it's in the pouch there. Revelation 1, 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. So Revelation 1, 3 ends, up, ends with the phrase, for the time is near. So John didn't waste any time jumping into this letter. I get the feeling as I read these verses, 4 through 6, that he thought Jesus would come even as he was penning those words. So the angel of verse 1, this is where the angel comes in. That's why we needed that angel back there in verse 1, must have told him to pick up the pen right now. So the recipients of the, if you can't find it, don't worry about it. That's okay. Uh, the recipients of this letter uh, were the seven churches. It should be in that zipper pouch on the side of that, of the, um, where, where the computer goes in. Um, are listed, they're listed individually here, and they each receive special attention. And these churches, let me tell you, they are not just spiritual bodies that never act. That's okay, Granny, just forget it. I'll be okay. You still have your stick. What's that? You still have your stick. I have my stick. Yes, I do. Now, Misuk, is this word right here, is that revelation? Yes. It is. Okay. Keep See? Yeah, see, I can read Korean. <laughs> right. I just did. No. No? You compared it in the thing. Okay. If I took that word and placed it somewhere along the line, in the middle of nothing... I can read Korean. You can't. Just get over it. <laughs> All right? <laughs> These churches were physical bodies. They weren't some spiritual makeup things... That, uh, that they did just to get by. This is a group of believers that banded together with a mutual faith and a shared cause. And as we learned in Sunday school from Pastor Jerry, what was that mutual cause? Christ. To preach the gospel. That's what they were there for. That's what they were to be doing, preaching the gospel. Now there's a whole back scene of that, and you guys know what that is. We walk holy lives, we study our Bibles, we pray, we do all that. We come together as a group and look at and, and spend time in His Word. All of that is behind the scenes to the outshowing of the gospel. Uh, I think it's great when we have guests come into the church. I, so please don't take this wrong. But this church body is for this church body. That's what we we're here to be trained to disciple people. Okay. That's what we, we come to do. Now, if somebody comes in who's lost and they get saved, I think that's an amazing thing. So don't, 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 uh, don't think I, I don't think that's right. I just say that the church body is for the church body. That's what we're here for. And they have this mutual shared faith, a mutual cause, 
and they banded together uh, to make all this happen. So these seven churches, they are indicative of all churches from that time until now. And I think the contents of this book and the lessons we're going to learn about these churches are applicable to us just as strongly as they were in those days. So I believe the point of, of writing to these specific churches is to allow us, Sage Creek Bible Church, to um, gauge ourselves and where we're at by comparing ourselves there to make sure we're not suffering through the same problems. The biggest issue that I see as I read about the seven churches is one of them specifically is called out for leaving their first love. They left their first love. Everything Jose has been teaching on love comes to, I think it comes to right there. They left their first love. And they should not. In loving each other, that's how you continue to love the Lord. So just like the Ten Commandments, I think, can be used to assess an individual's current spiritual condition. Uh, so too, I think these seven churches can be used as an assessment of a, church, of a church's current spiritual condition. And we're going to do that. And I'd like to do that objectively so that if we find out we've got an issue that we as a church need to solve, we solve that issue. Okay, so when we go through that, we want to seriously take this apart. So if you uh, and we uh, are not all we need to be for the service of Jesus Christ, and I'm, I'm speaking as a church, this is our opportunity to identify our errors and correct them. And we are going to do that. We are going to take an objective look, and I'm telling you, if we, if we see a shortcoming of our church, we need to fix it. And that's what we'll do as we go through this. Uh, because you know what? He's coming, and his coming is near, and we don't want to be, not be ready. We want to be ready to always be ready. Next slide, please, Lauren. I love this first phrase. It's up at the top up there. Whoops, I can't hardly reach it. Grace to you and peace. Grace to you and peace. Now, to me, that's kind of an odd start to the book of Revelation because once you get to chapter 6, and uh, Pastor Jerry was pointing out chapter 14, bad things happen. But now he's saying grace and peace. Why grace and peace? Because you're going to need it. You're going to need it. You're going to need it. Grace and peace, well said. Think about it, though. Grace and peace. The race is finished. The race is finished. But grace and peace to us because we ain't going to be there. Right? We ain't going to be there. John uses a phrase that I personally love in this. In fact, these words combine. I made the list. If I can, nope, I can't reach. I need a longer stick. Um... Those two words combine into a single verse 18 times in your Bible. 18 times. And you look at the authors there, you've got Paul. Paul is the uh, you know, significant majority there. Uh, you've got Peter. You've got John. Uh, those guys use that phrase, grace and peace. Three of them. 18 times. So where do you think they first heard it? Jesus. Jesus. From Jesus, right? This is the, uh, one of the ways that you and I are blessed by this book uh, that's not covered by the Beatitudes here. If we read here and keep the words of this book, they will surely bring grace and peace. They will bring grace and peace. Well, grace and peace, grace represents God's attitude toward the believer. He grants us grace, right? He grants us grace. Did you ever in your life have another human being grant you grace. You remember a time when somebody granted you grace. Yeah. Well, God takes that to the exponential level. For me, defining what grace means is like defining the word blessed. I, I struggle with it because it it's so vast and, and the scope of it is so large. So I went to a, a couple who are, I think, experts and we gained some insight into what grace and peace means. We had a, we stopped out and saw uh, Lauren and Pam last week, Granny and I did, and that was my question to them. Define for me grace and peace. 
and uh, they did an amazing job. In fact, um, I didn't have to go any further in my research than that conversation. First of all, grace is God's tender kindness toward the believer. God's tender kindness toward us. Uh, also, as we spoke about it, somebody said, Herb was there too, uh, that grace is in an inexhaustible supply. Would you agree with that? It's, you, you cannot exhaust God's grace. Also, believers in Jesus Christ in, in Jesus Christ cannot exceed the grace of Christ. I can't sin more than His grace can can cover. And grace, the last thought we talked about that I so enjoyed and that I think John is doing here is grace is reflective. Grace is reflective in that John here is reflecting the grace of God to fellow believers. We reflect the grace of God to others in our kindness to them. That's why I asked the question, has anybody ever showed you grace? Well, they have. I've had, people have shown me grace countless times. And every time it is a reflection of Jesus Christ uh, to me, through them. And then you've got peace. Well, peace speaks of relationship. When we have, when, here especially, when we say we have peace with God because of a grace-based relationship with Him, it is through grace, the grace of God, that we have peace with Him. And it's just so, the picture of that is amazing to me, grace and peace. Next verse, please, Lauren. I'd like you guys to, uh, well, to, to puzzle through this verse with me. Puzzle through it with me. Therefore. Now, the word therefore is used in the book of Romans 27 times. So that, to me, says the book of Romans ought to be read cover to cover. You, know, you can't read the book of Romans and piecemeal it and think you're going to understand what the book is about. Not when the word therefore is in the book 27 times. You have to read it. Granny and I have done this, uh, oh, probably 40 times. And I know that we, you can take the book of Romans, and when we leave our house, and when you get to Lyman, you can almost do the whole book of Romans on the Gideon app. And I'm telling you, you get a whole different perspective of that book if you take it as a whole. And then burrow down. So 27 times later, he says, therefore, having been justified by faith, that is us, right? We have been justified by faith. What do we have? We have peace, which here, and I loved uh, Lauren and Pam's definition here, a good relationship. Peace means a good relationship. Where once there was war with God, who was our former opponent, but now is our God. So we have peace with God. So when John says grace and peace, that tells us who we have peace with. We have peace with God. And then we find out how that peace comes about. And that is through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the means or the, or the uh, method for our peace. His death on the cross, he shed blood. We apply that to our souls and we have peace with God. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace. Now here we see peace and grace again together. Into this grace in which we stand. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God meaning we're supremely blessed. So as you look at that verse, and as I've spoken through it a bit, have I, have I missed something that you think is important there that we need to know? We have peace with God. It was an act of grace on His part to send Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. That is the means of our peace. And that was done through an act of grace on His part. Am I missing anything before we go to verse 3? You guys good with that? And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Do you guys glory in tribulations? I mean, if I was going to cut some stuff out of the Bible, wouldn't this be a thing to cut? So grace and peace, I, as I see that phrase, don't get me out of trouble. 
I wish they did. Right now they don't. But they certainly get us through trouble, don't they? That relationship that of peace that I have with Jesus Christ, because of the grace of God to put him in the role he did, gets me through trouble. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope is a word of, as Kevin so well defines, confident expectation. We look to the future. Not a laser pointer. Oh, thank you. Is it working? Uh, it's kind of it's it's uh, the one with the left eye. The one with the little line on it. So oh, it's not that button. Oh, okay. The dot's pretty small, but I think it's visible. It is visible. Thank you. You were pushing the wrong button, Marshall, but I figured it out. <laughs> right. Our IT section is amazing. He says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through an act of grace on God, on God's part, by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So I have uh, peace with God as an act of grace on his part by sending Jesus Christ to die for my sins. And I apply that to my soul as an act of faith. Looking forward to, or in the hope, of what is ahead of us. To me, it paints a wonderful picture. And I might be clunky in my words and my definitions and my explanations. But do you guys get it? Do you, are you okay with what I'm saying? Yes. So I, you know, it's a, I, I am just a, in, in awe of his word. So you and I have the grace and peace that John reflected from God to us through our faith-based relationship with Jesus Christ. So, and then Misu, is that, is that Romans? Yes. That is Romans? One letter? Serious. Yeah, it, it crunched it down. Now I'm going to watch in my notes because as I'm learning Korean, I, I have a question for you, and if I remember to ask it, I want you to point something out to me, okay? Next slide, please. Thank you, Lauren. John 1, 4. From him who is and who was and who is to come. Now, this is often taken to be Jesus Christ specifically. Uh, I think it's God the Father. Uh, there are five different places where you see the language uh, of this, and 1, 4, 1, 8, 4, 8. 11.17, um, the eternal God, who is the source of all grace and peace, I think he's introduced here as, to, as the one who is, which was, and is to come. Now, you know Jesus Christ and God are synonymous. They are, God is Jesus Christ wrapped in a human body. Because of the following references, to Jesus Christ, and we'll get to that in just a minute, and the Holy Spirit. I believe the Him here is God the Father. From Him who is, who was, who is to come. God the Father. Next slide, please, Lauren. Now here's where we get a little interesting. Revelation 1, 4, the seven spirits who are before His throne. Okay? These are the seven spirits. Now, here's where... Uh, something that we have done comes into play. We have used a lot of the Old Testament to go to the New to figure out what's going on, and in this case, it, it just is another example. There's much discussion about this, but this is where I'm at. I believe the seven spirits before his throne represent the Holy Spirit. And I believe that because of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a rod. Who is the rod? Jesus, from the stem of Jesse, in that lineage, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So the Spirit, and then he defines the Spirit seven ways. The Spirit is of the Lord. He is the Spirit of wisdom. He has the Spirit of understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Those are the seven attributes there of the Holy Spirit. So when we go to the book of Revelation and we see the seven spirits which are before his throne, I think now we've transitioned from speaking of God the Father, now we speak of the Holy Spirit. 
Next slide, please, Lauren. And these seven spirits, they're again connected to Jesus in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. I believe that's the Holy Spirit. It's not seven individual spirits. It is the package deal of what the Holy Spirit is. Uh, and, then, and these seven spirits are, they're going to play a very prominent role in what's to come. And we won't take time to, to, to talk about that today. But you can look up, I think I've got, um, no I didn't put it up there. Zechariah chapter 4. If you want to pursue your thought on that, go to Zechariah. Again, Old Testament, to look into the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. And that will help you put the package deal together. So in Revelation 1, 4, we see John, he quickly picks up his pen. He's going to relay the message from the angel, who is back behind me on my left shoulder. Okay, this is the actual angel that visited John. And, uh, and, and, and he's going to pen this message to the seven churches and by reflection to us. So he opens his letter by wishing them grace and peace from God and the Holy Spirit. But there is a third member of the Godhead that he's going to mention now. Next slide, please, Lauren. And that is found in verse 5. And from Jesus Christ. That's why I think that you've got God the Father and the Holy Spirit, because now he says, and from Jesus Christ, telling me that these other two parts of the Trinity, he wasn't referring to Christ specifically, but God the Father and the Spirit. And Christ here, um, he's passing grace and peace from Jesus Christ to the churches. So in John's opening here, we see God the Father, we see the Holy Spirit, and we see Jesus Christ the Son, all wrapped into, well, what we call the Trinity. Uh, this is a, a definition or a picture, a visual for me. God is the Father, God is the Son, and God is the Spirit. But there are three functions of, of, of Him. Next slide, please, Lauren. First, in, in our verse, Revelation 1.5. If you've got your Bibles open to Revelation 1.5, you will see the first phrase that is labeled about Jesus is that he is the faithful witness, or one who always speaks and represents the truth. He is faithful in the sense that he's the one whose testimony is absolutely reliable, or he is entirely worthy of being believed, right? Right? Uh, he is the faithful witness. He's the one who always represents God to us. Uh, that's why I, said I enjoy the, uh, the emphasis uh, from Sunday school on preaching the gospel, on spreading the word. Jesus Christ is called the faithful witness. He is why we are we. He is why we are we. Okay? So this is important to me because... Uh, verses like Hebrews 13, 5, where he says, I will, do I have that up there? No, I don't. When he says, when he is the faithful witness, he being good to his word, when he says things like, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, what does that mean to you? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, right? He is the faithful witness. What he says to you, he means. Next uh, slide, please, Lauren. Second, he's the firstborn from the dead. Okay, so for John, the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was absolute. Why is that? Why would it have been absolute to John? He was there. He was there. And I, I, I would have included this, but 1 John chapter 1, the first couple of verses, he said, we saw him. We touched him. He was alive. He was alive. Did you guys ever hear the, the song, um, Oh, what's her Dolly Parton, when she sings Alive or whatever it is, He Lives? Oh my goodness, it fires me up. He's alive. It's a resurrection song. She does a wonderful job. He's alive. That was a, a, a point on which John was certain because he had seen him. He had seen him after he had risen from the dead with his own eyes. So the world can tell John that he's a liar. I believe him. I believe him. When John said God was 
that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, I believe him. Plus the other, what, 600 people who saw him? I believe him. He saw Jesus after the resurrection with his own eyes. He touched him with his hands. So when he says he is the firstborn from the dead, that was true. So for John, and for me, and for you, all the objection, the sad you sees out there who don't believe in the doctrine of the resurrection, all of my issue was removed by the fact that Christ had risen. And in rising, Jesus had shown that his resurrection, uh, it involved the certainty that we will all resurrect as well. Next slide, please, Lauren. So when he's the firstborn from the dead, here we start this discussion. Now, we've talked about this before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But what does it mean, first of all, that he's the firstborn from the dead? What? Because other people rose from the dead. What do we mean, firstborn from the dead? He's the first one to get his glorified body. The Father honored him by giving him that glorified body first. Paul adds to the discussion here, he says, but now Christ is risen from the dead, and he's become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, how did death come by man? What does that mean? Adam. What did he do? Sin. He sinned. And death passed then upon all men. By man also came the resurrection of the dead. So by one man we all died. Also by one man we all live. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Have you been made alive? Yes. Yes, you have. You have put your faith in Jesus Christ to save your soul. You have been made alive where once you were dead. Amen. Of all who have ever been and whoever will be resurrected, Jesus is the premier one. So he's the firstborn, he's the first fruits. Um, but it does, as Granny said, it means that he was the first one to get his glorified body. Our turn is next. What is the next thing on God's uh, eschatological calendar? What's the next thing? The rapture. The rapture is next. And what do you get at the rapture? New body. Do you want a new body? I want a new body. We need one. I'm telling you, we need one. Yeah, yeah. I, in fact, I, last night I got up in the middle of the night and grabbed this big tube of uh, topical painkiller. <laughs> and I was hoping as I rubbed it, it would be inside as well as topical. I want a new body. But there's more to this thought that he is first begotten from the dead. Uh, next slide, please, Lauren. Colossians 1.18. He's the head of the body, the church, who is, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that's Jesus, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Jesus Christ in this church today has the preeminence. Amen. We love him, we adore him, we worship him, and as I say, I am honored, honored to worship him with you folks. Honored, absolutely honored, because you folks are his absolute favorites out of all the churches that have ever existed in the last 2,000 years, you are his favorite. You know how I know that? You don't know how I know that, do you? I can't tell you. It's, a, it's an angel brought the word to me. So he told me not to talk about it. You guys are his absolute favorites. Are you saying you got a word from God for us? A word from an angel. Was it the one behind me? <laughs> yeah, who's that one behind me? Jesus Christ is first begotten from the dead so that all things in them he may have the preeminence. He was first. But the preeminence of Jesus came at a cost. Next slide, please, Lauren. Well, he made himself, this is Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. He made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant. Now, a bond servant is one who willingly consents to serve. That's what a bond servant, Exodus 25, identifies that for us. He willingly consented to serve. As we go through the book of Revelation, these folks that are giving their lives for the Lord are doing it 
willingly. They are bond servants. Okay? So then he willingly took on the form of a bond servant. And what is that? What is a bond servant there? What does he mean? A slave. A slave in the form of what? A human. A human. Who said human? It was an okay answer. But we'll go with it, Kirsten. He took on the form of a human. He took on a body. He, and, and for him, that was humbling himself. And he came in the likeness of men. And he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. So he did what we have ahead of us if the rapture doesn't occur. He did it. All right? He's already been there and done that. Even the death of the cross. Well, that was necessary for the forgiveness of our sins. The most horrific thing that you could go through. Now, there's a word, therefore, again. Okay? So now we have a cause and effect. Because he did everything I underlined in green, God then exalted him. He has highly exalted him. And that is past tense. He rose from the dead to a glorified body. This body he took on did. And he gives him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now when he says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, what does that mean? Pretty much what it says, right? Everybody. Every knee shall bow. Those that re re reject Jesus Christ before they die, will they bow the knee to Jesus? Yes, they will. At the second resurrection, that they will bow their knee. So you can do it willingly as a bond servant, or you can do it unwillingly. It don't matter. You're going to do it. Right? It's an absolute. This is one of the absolutes of the scriptures. So when Jesus took on the likeness of men, by the way, he wasn't born in a middle class family. <laughs> he didn't work at McDonald's either. No, he didn't work at McDonald's either. Right? I don't, that's as political as I want to get today. But he wasn't born in a middle class family. He was born in a family that scratched out a living in a society where he was held in contempt. So the right to be the first begotten from the dead, as John writes about then, was an earned reward for what Jesus did. And he's calling our attention to that, what Jesus did for that. Next slide, please, Lauren. The third thing we see in our verse, verse 5 there, is that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And I love this. There are three things that I just want to cover as we go through this, okay? First of all, he is Lord, who according to the Father's plan, the master plan, and the Spirit's work, he grants believers his royal blessings of grace and peace, right? The ruler of kings of the earth. Uh, he is that. Daniel, where's Daniel? Right there. Daniel 2.21, he removes kings and raises up kings. Now, how could Daniel say that? How could Daniel even think that? He saw it, didn't he? Yeah. He saw it. the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, and that's where he left. But then it went on to fulfill his prophecy about the Greeks and then the Romans. God removes kings and he puts kings in their place. He's working a master plan. Now, do you think these kings do that willingly or knowingly that God put them there? I don't think so at all. I think God has his plan. We can get on board or not, but his plan is going to occur. Then there's Romans 13.1. The authorities that exist are appointed by God. He's the one that sets them up. That would be a order to a non-believer. It would, wouldn't it? To be a leader. Yeah. To think that you're a leader because God is you. That would be a order. I love that, John, because it's so true. What John is saying is that it would be abhorrent to a, a, a non-believer in Christ to, 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 to know that God put them there. And he's using them whether they want to be uh, agreeable to that or not. His plan and purpose is moving forward. And then there's Proverbs 21.1, which Herb has quoted many times. 
The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. So Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, is the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's what John is telling us, right? All of the fulfilled prophecy should be enough to convince anyone of that fact. So in the days to come, we have an election coming up in our country, don't we? We know what we want. God knows what we'll get. I hope we don't get what we deserve. <laughs> so we'll see, I guess. So, and again, that says, I grew up in a middle class family, and that's as political as I'm going to get. Right? Ne What's that? No. No? It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. The next slide, go ahead, next slide, please. This is the, what I have called in my own studies the Jose slide. Revelation 1 5. To him who loved us. Jose's done an, an amazing job teaching on this subject, so I'm not going to linger on it too long. John 3.35, the Father loves the Son who has given all things into his hand. So John stressed, this is back in his earlier book before he wrote Revelation. He stresses the love of the Father for the Son in the, in the whole book of John. But God also loves us. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. And that was because of what we read in the book of Philippians. He died on the cross. He humbled himself. So God put everything into his hands. But he also, as I say, loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He is a God of equity. He loves the world. And that is his righteous, his righteousness coming out. Uh, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You may be... Uh, this was part of my journey to Jesus Christ. I always had the idea that God sent Jesus into the world to crush us. He didn't send him to crush us. He sent him to save us. Amen. Not to crush us. And that was part of my thought. That, you know, it's a, this is an inescapable thing. He's, he, Jesus Christ, we're going to be... No, he sent him into the world that through him we might be saved. He took all that penalty for me. And then in John 17, 23, we again see reference to the world. I and them, you and me, Jesus and the Father, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I'm amazed by the extent of the love of Jesus Christ, of God the Father, for all of us. The love of God reaches us through Jesus. So just like the word blessed, dictionaries usually use <laughs> the word blessed in their definition. When you look up love, a lot of times they use the word love in the definition. That means nothing to me. I want to know what it means. So let's let uh, John define it here. Uh, next slide, please, Lauren. 1 John 3, 16. When we talk about the love of Jesus. By this we know love. Oh, I'm pushing the wrong button. By this we know love. Okay, so we're going to define love here. Because he laid down his life for us. So love is displayed in an action. Love is an action word. And in here we see specifically that it was Jesus Christ dying for me. That is an act of love. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Meaning that love is patterned to its recipients. The word Lauren and Pam used was reflective. I like the word reflective. Love is a reflective action word. Where his love for me is reflected from me to others. But whosoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Love doesn't allow us to ignore the needs of others. You guys remember that infamous verse in the book of James? When a brother comes to you in need, and what is said there? You guys remember that? Be warm and filled. Yeah, depart, brother. Be warmed and filled. And have you done any good? No. You didn't do anything. Love is an action word that actually accomplishes something. That's what love is. 
right? It accomplishes something. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So to me, love is defined by action and truth. So it's not an empty word. It is defined and displayed in action. Love is an action word. So when John says Jesus loves us, he knew this to be true because that love uh, was on full display in, in, in his action, Jesus. So that kind of action uh, is what John is writing about. Next slide, please, Lauren. Oh, my goodness. You guys have taken all my time. The last thing I want to say about the love of Jesus Christ, and then we're going to have to quit because I'm, I'm, uh, I've got 20 minutes left and we'll spend that on this point, right? The last thing I want to say about the love of Jesus Christ for each of us is that his love is unbreakable, it is indestructible, and it is shatterproof. Shatterproof. Have you guys ever had a toy that was unbreakable, indestructible, and shatterproof? Did it turn out? No. They say they are. It never turns out to be true. Romans 8.35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Okay, John has defined love for us. We are in that pool by faith. Who's going to separate us from that love? Who is going to do it? You think tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, maybe a sword? Where they cut off your head and now your body is in two parts? Does that separate you from the love of Christ? It will get you there faster, and I think with even better reward. I don't want to do that. I'll be glad to clap for the people who, <laughs> who that happens to. But um, no, I don't want to do it that way. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now verse 36, Romans 8, 36, is a, is a, a reference. Does... Does anybody know what that reference is? What's the cross reference there? What's he quoting as it is written? I, I, I'm asking because I can't remember, to be honest. Does anybody know what the cross reference is? While I read on, somebody find me that cross reference. Yet in all these things, and what I see in that phrase is no matter what goes wrong, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded. See, he just had a list, right? Tribulation. What's that? Yes, sir. Psalm 44, 22. Thank you. Psalm 44, 22. So it's 44 and half of that is 22. So we can remember it easy. It's great. Thank you, Lord. It's a good number. Again, as we talk about these things in Revelation, we're taking Old Testament, going through the New Testament. Uh, that the Bible is a, as I hold this book up, it is a seamless book end to end. Right? So yet in all these things, that whole list of stuff, we're more than conquerors through and love us. For I am persuaded, now he's saying that neither death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the love of God is reflected to us. Lauren, thank you for that word. I love it. It is reflected through Jesus Christ to us. I think it's amazing. Now, are we done? I got more notes, but let me, because uh, there is the reflected action. Revelation 1.5 says to him who washed us from our sin in his own blood. There's the action part. But we'll pick that up next week. Let me see if I have anything else. No. Misuk, I'll have to ask you my question at the next time we get together. Because uh, I can read Korean except for this. <laughs> Do you guys understand the love of God now? I mean, from that perspective. Jose has done such a, a uh, I always like to think yeoman's job, which means you're the guy that's done all the heavy lifting. And he has done that for us in that word. So love is an action word. 
that is defined by what Jesus did on the cross for you. It's an action. Uh, it's, a, it's a getting an assignment from your boss. That's an action. It's an action word. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He humbled himself. He became a bondservant, a willing slave by, be, by taking on flesh. And there you go. His death on the cross was the action part of the love uh, that he showed for us. So it's an action word. We do that for each other. We reflect God's love to each other. And that's what makes the united body of Christ come together. We have folks here, as they say, whose English is not their first language. I'm sure they struggle, even as we go through these things. Uh, to, I consider them geniuses. They're like Kim. You got Kim. You got Misu. You got Donnie. You got other people who are bilingual. To me, that's, to me, that's uh, genius stuff. I can hardly speak English. And that's why my dad always said, don't you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm sure that's why he said it. Because I was dyslexic, or exlexic, when I was born. I was there as backwards. So there you go. Any thoughts on this before we close? John is excited about what he's going to write about. And I'm excited about what we're going to read. All right? I'm going to quit now. I am. <coughs> I am committed to that. <laughs> I'm closing my computer. All right? Praise God. I echo uh, uh, Jose's words. We love every one of you, specifically. Everyone? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sacrificial yes. love, right? Sacrificial <laughs> love. Yes. That's right, Kirsten. Do you know... Which one of us would be Philip and which one of us would be Matthew? I'm just asking. Because Philip wanted to kill Matthew because he <laughs> So which one which one are you? Simon. It was Simon. Oh I'm sorry, is it Simon? You're right. Thank you for correcting that. Because Simon was a zealot. And what was his mission? To kill tax collectors. To kill tax collectors. Right? So which one of us is Simon and which one of us is Matthew? I'll let you sleep on that tonight. Okay. I think we switch roles now and again. Probably. Probably do. This amazing thing that the Lord can bring so many different people together to form a body to worship, isn't it? I'm amazed by that. I am literally amazed by that. Different viewpoints on some things. Who cares? We focus on Jesus Christ. That's what we focus on. All right. All right. Jose, you've got the yeoman's job of closing us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the work of the Holy Spirit that has happened today as we went through your word. I pray that you continue to work and uh, that we will uh, that we would be very equipped, Father, to uh, in the use of Thank you.